Good to see you guys. My name is Gavin. I'm one of the pastors here. And man, what a cool morning. I just want to say to the parents in the room uh, who dedicated your kiddos this morning to Jesus, man, thank you for taking that step of just saying, church, we need your help. We're going to pray for these kids. We want them to grow up to know, love, serve, worship, adore, abide in, live for Jesus Christ. So cool, and may it be true that God would answer those prayers. And so I just want to say I'm proud of you guys for taking that step. We as the church family support you and want to walk with you in that. And now, City Light, I was thinking this week, I've got some good news that I want to share with you this morning. It dawned on me, here's the good news, he's still risen. Uh Amen? He is still risen! Last week, we celebrated Easter that Jesus rose from the grave, and I want you to know that's not just some Christian holiday. That's the reality that Jesus rose from the grave, and he's still alive. Jesus Christ is alive. He is speaking to us through his Holy Spirit and through his word. He is pursuing his people. He's rooting out sin in our lives. He's giving us joy as we walk with him, empowering us to to be salt and light to the world. Jesus is alive. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is uh, he's speaking to us. One of the primary ways he speaks to us is through the Bible. And at City Light, we study the Bible. We love the Bible. We teach, study, apply the Bible. And so this morning, we're going to kick off a new series in the Bible in the Old Testament book of Judges. So would you please open your Bibles with me to the book of Judges, chapter 1. Uh, we're going to just kind of walk right through it. And so we will be in chapter 1 of Judges this morning. If you're new to your Bible, uh, that's like the seventh book of the Bible. Um, if you have a church Bible, it's on page 200, so on the very front end of your Bible. And uh, so uh, let me give a, just a little bit of preface to the whole series in the book before I start this morning's sermon. And uh, first, Judges. Why the name Judges? Well, the, the name itself comes from the 12 leaders in the book of Judges that God rises up to to lead and deliver his people. But it's a little bit misleading. Just want to give you a heads up. Judges, in this context, is not referring to like the judicial judges in our context that make, um, declare guilt and innocence and oversee the law in civil and in criminal cases. Instead, they were leaders that God rose up to deliver and lead their people. So those are the judges. Uh, you need to know that this is in the Old Testament. And so if you're new to your Bible, I want to let you know there's an Old Testament and New Testament. 66 books comprise our canon, our Bible. 39, I believe, of those are in the Old Testament. That records the, the section of history before Jesus Christ came to the earth. And so we read in the Old Testament how God created the world, created humans to be in relationship with him, records the accounts of how sin entered the world through our first parents, and we start to see the effects and decay of sin in personal lives and in all the earth, and we start to see these glimpses of God pursuing his people, God calling out of the broken world a set-aside people for himself to be in covenant or promised relationship with him. And, and, and we see this picture of God pursuing his people. This, this Old Testament is filled with all kinds of genres. You should know that. There's, there's historical narrative that we will be... I've always wanted that to happen while I was preaching. I just wish it didn't happen during the introduction. God, would you like when I'm bringing it later at the application, do that same thing? Apparently, the Lord loves historical narrative. It's what we will be studying. Additionally, in here, we find poetry, we find prophecy, we find songs, we find wisdom, literature. Uh, but, I, but I need you to know more than anything that the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, all of the Bible, tells one story, and it all points us to Jesus. It's the story of God creating the world, sinful man falling into sin, and God rescuing and pursuing his people. In the Old Testament, we get all these cool pictures of God sending temporary and imperfect leaders to save and deliver his people that all point to that ultimate and perfect savior and leader that would come, Jesus Christ, that we celebrated his resurrection just last week. And so it is all about Jesus. Now, this book, Judges, let me give you a a, a quick kind of history place marker of where we're at. Uh, the, The book of Judges really records a very uh, tumultuous time in the history of Israel. God's 
covenant people at that time. And um, the people had been enslaved to the nation of Egypt where they were not free to serve, love, and worship their God. So God delivers them from slavery through a man named Moses. They then wander in the wilderness for 40 years until God delivers them into the promised land, the land of Canaan that he had promised to them. The, this land was to be set aside uh, by God for his people to live in where they would be free to worship and serve him as a set-apart nation. And that's where our story picks up. Right when the people of God enter into this promised land, the land of Canaan, and it records about 300 years from when they enter the promised land until they are led by a king, starting with Saul and then David and Solomon and, and so on and so forth. And so it's about 300 years wherein they're without a king, but God sends these leaders called judges. Uh, this, it takes place from approximately the mid-14th century B.C. to about the mid-11th century B.C. That's where we're at historically. And uh, to kick off the series, we're going to look at the first chapter, and I want to preach a sermon to you called Dirty Dishes, Idolatry, and the Covenant Love of God. Dirty Dishes, Idolatry, and the Covenant Love of God. We're going to be reading this morning in Judges chapter 1 how the Israelites made these little compromises, these little half-truths, these little accommodations to sin in their life, and how these little compromises led to devastating results. And so too, we're going to see how little compromises, little accommodations to sin in our own lives can lead to devastating results in the lives of uh, of God's people. And uh, we're also going to get a glimpse of Jesus and how God keeps his covenant love to an unfaithful people. Now, let me kick off Dirty Dishes, Idolatry, and the Covenant Love of God by telling you a story. Uh, when I was in college, a senior at UNO, me and two buddies, Todd Baker and Cody Villarreal, moved into a rustic cabin just south of Fort Calhoun that happened to be on 25 acres of timber. Rednecks paradise. This place was rustic, wildlife everywhere, and if you attend City Light Church for any amount of time, you will hear plenty of sermon illustrations about the cabin, including the time I totaled my Ford Contour in the driveway, the time we started a small forest fire while burning trash in a burn barrel, how we raised 24 ducks and chickens in the front yard, and the many nights we spent catching bats in our living room. But this morning, my story comes from inside the cabin. See, when the three roommates, we moved into the cabin, each of us had been living on our own, and so we had acquired our own set of dishes. We each had our own pots and pans and bowls and forks and plates, and, and uh, I believe together we counted something like 20 pans, 60 plates, and 10,000 drinking cups. Now, this was great news because the rustic cabin did not come with a dishwasher, and being kids that grew up in the 90s, we had never really lived without a dishwasher, so we thought this is a good, the providential loving kindness of the Lord that we have 10,000 drinking cups. And so what happened, as you might imagine, is that in the first month, we kind of worked our way through my dishes. So we would cook and eat and use those dishes, and we would just throw the dishes in the sink, and they kind of filled up the left side of the sink and then started to spill out a little bit. And it was no problem when we ran out because we had Todd's dishes. And so we kind of got into his dishes and we, we stacked up layers three and four. And then we kind of migrated across the countertop and managed to stack up four different layers of dirty dishes. And week six and seven, we started to run out of Todd's dishes. So we started into Cody's dishes. We managed to get it five to six layers high on the left side. The dirty dishes then migrated to the right side of the sink, wherein we came up with configurations and stackings of dishes that would blow the minds of most cutting-edge architects and structural engineers. I mean to tell you, this thing was stacked high. You might have no understanding physically of how this happened, but we were pros at it. Now, what happened was um, we got down to one bowl, one plate, one cup, and one fork, and no one wants to use the last one, right? Because when you use the last one, you're basically signing up for doing all the other dishes. And so what happened was, rather than using that last one, I noticed for about two weeks subsequent to that, we just all started getting fast food on the way home. And so for a couple more weeks, we're all getting Taco Bell on the way home from work and school, and no one wants to ask the uh, elephant of the question in the room, who is going to wash these dishes? Because therein we let in the fact that we've noticed the seven-foot dish monster, right? We're all just playing it cool like we had no idea what was happening. So this carried on for a couple weeks until that one infamous day. 
that infamous day at the cabin, I'll never forget pulling up to the cabin in my Ford Contour, opening the door, and immediately being struck by the pungent odor that smelled like rotting flesh. Now, since it was out in the country, I thought for sure a deer or other large animal had expired in the wilderness near the house, and it, it was just rotting out, no problem. So I did what any reasonable human being would do. I held my breath, ran to the door, unlocked the cabin door, and went inside. Safely inside, I then took a long, deep inhale to catch my breath, and as I did... Ladies and gentlemen, I experienced the, most, experienced the most rancid, putrid, shocking, repulsive stench I have ever experienced in my life. I discovered that the smell of rotting flesh wasn't outside the cabin, it was inside the cabin. See, a previously undiscovered chunk of Cody Villarreal's fish stick, somewhere around base layer number three, <laughs> had been slowly rotting from the inside out, and on that particularly warm day, the air conditioner quit working in the cabin, which just kind of fast forward the fermentation and rotting process until the rotten fish stick literally popped. It popped. It exploded. We had an exploding rotten fish stick that spewed out rancid fish rotting flesh smell all over the cabin in Fort Calhoun. So, uh, Fighting my own gag reflex, I immediately ran out to my contour, drove down North 72nd Street to the Home Depot where, and I literally bought three gas masks and a gallon of bleach. <laughs> Called my roommates. We had a, a roommate meeting back in the kitchen where we pondered, did we just throw everything away and start over? But then concluded that we had no money, and so gas masks on, gloves on, and a gallon of bleach in hand, we bleached out every inch of that kitchen the 60 plates, 20 pans, and 10,000 cups. What started off as a small compromise, one dirty cup today, one pan with a little bit of ramen noodles in the bottom tomorrow, one half-eaten chunk of fish stick, over time, turned into an atomic bomb that literally exploded in our kitchen. City Light, I say that to say that spiritually, compromise happens the same way. One little compromise that we make, a half-truth that we tell, settling for a small sin, allowing certain idols just to sit root and take root in our hearts, a little unforgiveness there, a little bit of lust there, nothing too extreme, a little compromise here to get the promotion, over time turns into landmines that are ready to explode in our lives. And what we see in the first chapter of Judges that we're going to look at today is we read the story of, of God's people that are stacking the dishes of compromise as they come into the promised land. And as they do, they are laying landmines of rotten fish sticks that we're going to see them step on and explode throughout the rest of the book. Cycles of sin followed by God's deliverance, all because their initial disobedience laid the soil that further disobedience took root in, grew up in, and wreaked havoc in their spiritual lives. And as we take a look at the spiritual compromise and the corner cutting of the nation of Israel and the ultimate demise that it led them to, I've been praying, God, would you reveal in our hearts as individuals and as a church, what are the little pieces of sin that we're just accommodating and tolerating in our lives? What are the sinful pieces of half-eaten fish stick that we just think, you know, it's not that big of a deal. It really isn't going to affect me. It's really not a problem. And City Light, I need you to know, if you're a follower of Jesus, is it true that your sins, past, present, and future, are 100% forgiven by Jesus Christ? Yes. Is it true that there is no more eternal consequences for you to pay for, for your sins in eternity, because Jesus already paid for them on the cross? Yes. But is it true that we still bear and see the consequences of compromise and sin in our lives? Yes. Is it true that it can affect the people that we love, the church of Jesus Christ, our witness, generations, our children's? Yes. And so I've been praying, God, would you show us in this text areas of compromise and sin in our lives that we're tolerating and accommodating? And show us, Jesus, not only your grace that forgives our sin, but your empowering grace to help us root out these areas of compromise so that they don't explode with devastating consequences into our lives. Let's get into our verses now. We're going to primarily be looking at, at all of chapter one, and it's a lot of verses, so I'm going to uh, try to take us through it pretty quick, but I actually want to start in chapter two. Because I think chapter 2, verse 2, kind of makes a summary statement of all of chapter 1. And then I'm going to go back into chapter 1 and unpack it. It says in chapter 2, uh, verse 2, it starts, I said, in verse 1, 
I said, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? All right, in this summary verse, God is simply reminding them of the instructions that he gave them as he led them into the promised land. So repeatedly, God had told his people as he delivered them from slavery, I'm going to give you a promised land. I'm going to lead you into the promised land. When you get there, displace all of the inhabitants, destroy their places of idol worship, make no accommodations. The goal was this was to be a geographic region, a nation, wherein God experienced and lived in relationship with God, and wherein outside cultures could cultures could look in and see what does it look like when people live and walk in relationship with God. This was to be a nation set apart as a witness to all the nations of the one true God in the Bible. And so God said, make no accommodations. You tear down idol worship. You displace the inhabitants. This is a place set aside. Now, God's commands were very clear. And I want to be clear with us, the purpose For God driving out the Canaanites was not vengeful, it was not economic, it was not nationalistic, it was spiritual. They were to be driven out so that God's people would not fall under their religious influence and start worshiping idols themselves. Now, quick side note, this is no justification for a holy war. This was a unique time in redemptive history wherein God's people actually lived in a geographic nation state. That does not happen anymore. Israel is a spiritual Israel, the people of God all over the earth. This doesn't justify holy war today. This was a unique time in redemptive history. But the point we need to see is that God told him, displace the idols from the land. This is a set-aside land, and you need to kick out all of the idol worshipers and destroy their uh, places of worship. Now, the question we need to ask is, so how did they do? How did they do obeying God to kick out the idol worship in the land? What I want to do real quick is kind of give us a flyover summary of chapter 1. And so we're going to see how the Israelites did kicking the people out of the land and honoring and obeying God. And FYI, I know a lot of new Christians in the room, a lot of people that are new to the Bible. Uh, The nation of Israel was broken up into 12 tribes. And so as I read some of these names, it's referring to a whole tribe of people. Uh, So let's take a look at how God's people did. Uh, Chapter 1, starting in verse 4, it'll be on the screen if you want to follow along. It says, Then Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they defeated 10,000 of them at Bezek. Pretty good. Verse 8. And the men of Judah fought against Jerusalem and captured it and struck it with the edge of the sword and set the city on fire. Okay, so far, not so bad. Skip down to verse 19. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country. Good. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Well, not so good. Verse 21. But the people of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So the Jebusites had lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Not good. Verse 22. The house of Joseph also went up against Bethel. Skip down to 24. And the spies saw a man coming out of the city, and they said to him, Please show us the way into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. So they make a covenant with the Canaanite to get into the city rather than trusting God to help him get into the city. Not good. Verse 27. Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheon and its villages, or Tanakh and its villages, or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages, or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. Those are hard to pronounce, by the way, so be thankful you just get to read along quietly. For the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. When Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, hmm, but did not drive them out completely. Not good. Verse 29, and Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Not good. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol. So the Canaanites lived among them, but became subject to forced labor. Not good. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon 
or of Al- Alab, or of Oxib, or of Helba, or of Aphek, or of Rahab. Not good. Verse 33. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, or the inhabitants of Beth Anath. So they lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and, the, and of Beth Anath became subject to forced labor for them. How we do in Israel? Not so good. God said, I'm going to put you in the land. You have one job. Displace the people, destroy their altars, don't make covenants, don't compromise. What do the Israelites do? They took the land and they compromised. Said, you know, um, maybe we just keep these people here. I mean, after all, the land's good and things are going pretty well and uh, they're not really bothering anything and their places of worship are not that bad. And, you know, we'll just worship God and we will coexist and maybe we'll just have some relationships with them after all. What harm could come from a few Canaanites and Perizzites living in the land? The Israelites compromised and now they are living in the promised land alongside the idol-worshiping Canaanites and the false gods that they worship. And like a buried mine or a leftover half-eaten fish stick, these idols are now lying dormant in the land like little landmines that we're going to see Israel step on throughout the rest of the book of Judges, exploding with spiritual consequences in their lives. They accommodated in what happened. Well, next week we're going to take a look into chapter 2 and see kind of the, the fish stick exploding and all the carnage that happens. But, but I'm going to save that. I just want to give us a glimpse. Why was the compromise such a big deal? What happened? Let me show you one verse that I think summarizes it. Chapter 2, verse 12. It's on the screen. It says, And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land. Uh-oh. They went after other gods from among the people who were around them and bowed down to them. See, what happened is a small compromise. We don't have to kick out all the inhabitants. We don't have to take down all of their altars. Had the disastrous result in the spiritual lives of God's people as they forsook God and worshiped these foreign pagan gods. They essentially said, man, a little compromise here, a little half obedience there. What does it really matter? But two chapters in, we see the tragic result. Their initial disobedience became the soil in which further disobedience took root and wreaked havoc in their lives. And man, city light, shouldn't this be such a wake-up call to us? Isn't it true that it's so easy to justify sin and idolatry in our own lives, right? What's, what's the big deal? Just a little compromise there, just a small sin, just a half-truth, just a white lie. Everyone does it. I'm forgiven anyway. And it's so true that my idols of popularity and success and comfort and image, they aren't really that bad. I mean, I still love Jesus. I'm in church every Sunday. I can just kind of manage my sin, just make sure it doesn't get out of control. I don't have to destroy it and root it out of my life. But the danger for us, for you and for me, for us as a church is the same as Israel's, that if we start with small compromises, it can quickly lead to disastrous results in our lives. Man, I've seen marriages destroyed because a man said, it's just porn, I'm not cheating on my wife, right? It's just a little thing. I've seen families destroyed because they said, I'm not really addicted, I could stop anytime I wanted. I just go to the boats on Fridays, I could stop anytime. With little compromises, we think it's not that big of a deal. Man, and like a landmine, we give our enemy a foothold to explode our sin in disastrous ways in our lives. Small compromises over time lead to disastrous results. And so Jesus, would you teach us as we look at this scripture, God, would you expose the unrepentant sin, the little compromises that we settle for in our hearts, in our lives. The way I want to kind of unpack this with what time I have left, I just kind of want to ask two questions of this text. Number one, that we might learn from them, what, what was the attitude of the Israelites that led them to these little compromises, these little half obediences in their lives? And, and is that something that's going on in our hearts, in our lives, that we might root that out? So what was their attitude? And number two, where do we see Jesus in this text? How does this point us to the grace of God and the saving work of Jesus Christ? And so number one, I want to ask the question, 
What's the why behind the what that they did here? What, what was their attitude that led to their half-hearted obedience to God? And I think there's probably a lot of reasons for their compromise and not kicking out the idols in the land. But, but let me point out two attitudes that I think that are apparent in the text that I think we can be guilty of as well. The first attitude is this. I'm going to trust in my plan over God's plan. I'm going to trust in my plan over God's plan. Here's where I think we see it in the text. Uh, the tribe of Manasseh in verse 28, the tribe of Zebulun in verse 30, the tribe of Naphtali in verse 33, all managed to enter into the promised land and take control of their territories. But each one of these three tribes, rather than displacing the inhabitants and destroying their places of worship, what did it say they do? They subjected them to forced labor. See, I think they realized, God... Um, uh, I like your ends. I like the idea of us prospering in this land and worshiping you and really thriving here, but I'm not so sure your plan of making that happen is really that intelligent, right? See, um, the Israelites had been a nomadic kind of desert people for 40 years, for an entire generation. And see these people in the promised land? They had been farming in this community for generations. They had technology and and experience and understanding how to farm the land and make it prosper. Why would we kick them out and destroy them when, when we could use them for our benefit? See, we've been living in tents and, and, and being nomadic people for 40 years, but these people have the technology and the experience to know how to thrive in this land. God, I like your, your end goal of us thriving here, but your plan on getting us here, it seems really foolish to kick out such an economic and social resource. So instead, we're going to go with our plan. I think we're just going to leave these people here and accommodate them, and we are going to learn from them. A chapter in, they're worshiping their gods, and they have forsaken their own God. Why? Because they thought, man, maybe my plan is better than God's plan. Maybe he needs my help a little bit. And I want to ask City Light, are there areas in your heart and life where you are compromising, where you are accommodating sin and idolatry in your heart? Because you just don't trust God's plan right? Like, you're confident that God loves you. You know he created the world, but you're not so confident in his competence to run your life. And so you think God's plan, well, that's not working out real well, so let's try it my way. I think trusting our plan over God's plan could happen in any arena of our lives, but consider one, I think, I think we do it at work, right? Maybe God's plans for you have not been working out so well. The whole, like, pray hard, work hard, wait on the Lord for good opportunities because you feel like you got hired before everyone else and everyone else has already been promoted over you, right? Or you're still on monster.com every afternoon looking for that job that's actually going to use your skill set and your career, right? But everybody else seems to be in their sweet spot. Why not me? And we can think, God, maybe your plan isn't quite effective. See, the boss really wants me to kind of start deceiving the clients. And I'm not really going to get promoted unless I kind of slander the competitor. And unless I tweak the numbers and everyone else does it anyway, I'm never going to get ahead in this career. And I just got to play the game. And I have to, for a season, work 80 hours at the expense of my faith, my devotion life, and my family to get ahead. Maybe it happens in school. Maybe you think, man, God's plan doesn't really work out. And after all, the professor never said I couldn't put those codes in the graphing calculator. Uh-oh, don't act like you've never done it, right? The professor didn't say I couldn't actually store that in my laptop. or It's not actually cheating, and I'm never really going to get there God's way, and God's plan isn't working out, and so we, we compromise. You say, God, I'm not going to trust in your plan. I'm thankful that you want to bless me, but this is the only way I'm going to get there. So we accommodate sin, and we allow it to happen, and we allow the idol of success and popularity and promotion take root in our heart, and we sacrifice our integrity and our honesty, honesty at the altar of that God. Maybe God's plan isn't working out for you in the area of relationship, right? It's the springtime. Every other day, you're getting an invitation to a wedding or a bridal shower. You got 17 of them posted with magnets on the refrigerator, but you haven't been asked out on a date in three years, right? You're always going to the weddings alone. Your plus one is your girlfriend, and you think, man, God's plan of like waiting on the Lord, praying for that godly person to come along and sweep me on, well, that just doesn't work, right? 
God's plan was great 200 years ago, but that's an antiquated culture. Man, today, if you want to get someone to like you, you have to compromise physically. It just doesn't happen any other way. Man, if you want to make friends, you have to engage the party scene. If you're not willing to get drunk and high, then forget having friendships, right? And so we compromise. We say, God, I love that you want me to be in relationship and have a family. I just don't trust your plan in getting me there. It doesn't really work that way anymore. And so we compromise. We accommodate sin. We say, God, your plan, it's really not going to work anymore. And so we leave the idol of relationship and acceptance lying in the land, right? And we sacrifice our devotion to God and our purity to worship that idol. Man, how is it that you're trusting in your plan versus God's plan? I think the second attitude that we see in the Israelites in this text that I think we can be guilty of is this. I'm going to trust in my power instead of God's power. I'm going to trust in my power instead of God's power. Let me show you where I get this in the text. Look at verse 19. We read that the people of Judah took possession of the hill country, but, quote, they could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had chariots of iron. Well, that seems like weak sauce, doesn't it? They could not because they had iron. I think God has a different assessment of the situation. Look right next to it to chapter 2, verse 2. God says, I told you to drive out the inhabitants, but you have not obeyed my voice. In a sense, the Israelites are saying, we could not. And God's saying, no, you would not. Here was Israel's excuse. Oh, them plains folks, they had chariots. We couldn't go after them. We had the technology and the power and the experience to battle the enemy in the hillside, but on the plains, well, they just had faster horses. They were more technologically advanced. They had more metal on their tanks. Well, ducky for them, Judah, you had God, right? When was it ever about your strength? The verse before said they defeated the enemy in the hillside because the Lord was with them. And now all of a sudden they're concerned about greater technology. They're saying, we're not going to go after them. They've got iron chariots. Man, this is the same people who one generation prior had seen God send plagues on their, nation, on, on their enemy nation to deliver them. These are the same people who had literally watched the power of God part an ocean so that they could walk through. They have seen the power of God. And all of a sudden they see some iron chariots. They do a quick calculation in their heads and their hearts and they say, I can't do it. Well, they've just got better technology. Man, isn't it true that we can so easily assess our own power and our own limitations and base our chance of success based on what we can do in our power and in our strength? Let me ask you, are there areas of compromise in your life that you are accommodating because you are trusting in your power and not God's power? Man, I do this all the time. We think of what we can't do. Maybe it's a besetting sin, a repeated temptation. I can't kick this habit. I can't resist going to those websites. I can't stop this substance. I can't quit getting drunk. I can't do that. So we assess our own power and limitations, and we conclude that we can't overcome. And so we leave these idols of pleasure or escapism or addiction in our hearts because we just decide we can't get rid of them. I can't do it. Or maybe it's taking a step of faith that we need to take. Man, I, I, I can't forgive that person. I can't share my faith at school. I can't share what's really going on in my city group. I can't lead a Bible study in my office. I can't be on a serve team. I'm not the extroverted Chris Haruska. I'm not the Bible knowledge guy. I can't do that. We assess our own power and conclude, I can't. And we leave the idols of comfort and security and safety lying in the land, ready to explode. Man, City Light, I think we tell ourselves, I can't so much that we forget the simple reality that God can Somebody say, God can. God can. can. Man, when did anything depend on our power anyway, huh? Raise your hand if you knit yourself together in your mother's womb. Raise your hand if you rose from death to win your own salvation. Raise your hand if you put the Holy Spirit in your heart to equip you for life and ministry. That's what I thought. We've never depended on our own strength. Why would we start doing it now? I declare, City Light, that that we would take that voice that says, I can't, in our heads, in our hearts, and we would replace them with the phrase, but God can. I can't, but God can. I can't overcome that addiction, but God can. I'm going to admit my problem, cry out to God, get help, be accountable. I can't, but God can. I can't encourage that person at work that God has been laying on my heart. I don't have the words to say. 
I'm no better off than they. I can't do it, but through me, God can. Through me, God can give me the words. He can give me the heart. He can give me the words to say in that moment. I can't serve in ministry, lead a Bible study, make a difference, but through me, God can. I can't, but God can. Somebody tweet that out. That's going on a bumper sticker somewhere. I can't, but God can. Man, Israel compromised and left idols lying in the land because they looked at their power and their plan rather than looking at God's power and his plan. And as a result, carnage exploded in their lives. Man, City Light, would we never be a people who, who place confidence in our power and our plans? You know, to be a follower of Jesus, it, it means to trust him where we can't trace. It means to follow him when it doesn't make logical sense. It means to obey him even if it costs us something. Economically, it seems foolish to obey him even when we don't know where he's taking us, to take steps of faith even when we feel underqualified, undereducated, and underprepared because we live by his power and his plan and we belong to him. Amen? Amen. Amen. But the humbling, humbling reality in all this, man, even if we bat a thousand from this day forward, which we won't, we are still a people who have compromised. The reality is, in our hearts lie dormant all kinds of idols that we have refused to kick out. We are a half-hearted people who, who are content giving half-hearted devotion to a fully dedicated God. And the question is, what does God do with a disobedient people like us? How does God respond to half-hearted people like us? And I want to end my sermon in chapter 2, kind of where I began because I think in it, we get a picture of the grace of God and some encouraging words that he wants to give to us this morning. Uh, look at chapter 2, verse 1. This is where God sends an angel to deliver a promise. Verse two, or chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now an angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bacchum. Now hold on a second. I read this passage like 100 times in this last week. And I've read through this verse a hundred times, and it never dawned on me, why in the world did the angel come up from Gilgal to Bacham, right? It's an angel. Why, why, why the geographical reference? Why did he have to come up from one city to it? He's an angel. Couldn't he just come out of the clouds? Couldn't he appear out of nowhere? Could, suddenly appear in an angel? Doesn't matter. Why did he come from Gilgal? What, was he on a horse, a razor scooter? What's this guy? He's got to travel to, he's an angel, and then as I read some books by some people who are a lot smarter than me, all of a sudden I realized the reason why the angel came from Gilgal is the book before this is the book of Joshua. Chapter 5, verse 9, it says that in the city of Gilgal is where the people of God had last met with God and where God reminded them of his covenant to them, his covenant promise. It was in the city of Gilgal that they had experienced God forgiving them of their sins. It was in Gilgal that they had experienced God making a renewed covenant with them of, I will be your God, you will be my people, and nothing will ever change that. And so it is that the messenger from God comes from the place that they last met with God and experienced his grace to remind them of his promise for them. And I just want to say, maybe, maybe this morning is your Gilgal. Maybe you feel like, I have experienced the carnage of my own compromise, and it was in a church service the last time I met with Jesus 10 years ago, and maybe God brought you here for a baby dedication, per the invite of a friend. Maybe you were walking by and getting rained on, so you just came in, saw donuts, and sat down and stayed. Maybe God brought you back to your Gilgal because he wants to make a reminder to you of his promise, his covenant that he has made to you. And then look at the message of the angel. Uh, in 1B, he says, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with, this, with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this that you have done? Okay, well, that seems kind of encouraging, but kind of not, doesn't it? On the one hand, God is saying, I have sworn that I will never leave you as my people. But then the second half of the covenant, he says, but I have also sworn that I won't bless you as a disobedient people. And he ends up by saying, what have you done? What am I supposed to do? I'm upholding these two promises. And here we find this tension that we're going to see throughout the entire book of Judges. Is God going to be true to his people and pursue them and keep them in relationship with them as he has promised? Or is he going to disown these disobedient people as he promised? You have to be obedient for me to be in relationship which of these covenants, which of these promises is he going to uphold? 
City Light, it's only on this side of the cross that we fully understand how God was able to resolve this tension. Because it was on the cross that Jesus literally took the guilt and sin of his people, of our compromises, of our half-hearted devotion, of our unfaithfulness, and he died for them and for me and for you. And it was on the cross that God's promise was fulfilled, that he would never leave or forsake his people, that he would find a way See, on the cross, God took all of our disobedience and placed it on Jesus. God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus lived a life with no compromise of perfect righteousness, and he did it in your place so that God could be both the covenant or the promise maker, I will always be your God, and the covenant keeper who paid the price to keep a half-hearted, disobedient people like us in relationship with him. Amen? This morning, I think God just wants to encourage some people in the room with that message. Just as Israel heard from this angel, right after the proverbial fish stick had exploded, they had forgotten their God, they're living with the carnage and consequences of their disobedience and compromise, and God reminds them. And maybe God brought you here this morning to remind you of his covenant for you. Even though you're a person of half-hearted obedience, you have compromised and strayed. You've accommodated sin. I will not let you go. And it was the angel that reminded them of their covenant. And the way that we remind ourselves of God's covenant to us in the New Testament is by taking communion. Communion is a physical and tangible reminder of the cost, that it, the expense that it costs God to keep his promise to us, the very life and death of his son, Jesus Christ, on a cross. And if you have received Jesus as your Savior, if you have trusted him for salvation, we're going to take communion. I invite you to come forward. I invite you to come forward with a humble, glad, worshipful heart that God has pursued you. He has kept his covenant with you. Let me read uh, the instructions for communion. And as I do, I'd invite the communion service to come forward. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'm going to pray. The band is going to play, and the communion servers are going to come up. And if you're new to us at City Light... um, If you're a follower of Jesus, you're welcome to take communion here. And the servers will be up here. They're going to break the bread for you. You dip that in the juice and partake that way. There's not going to be any ushers to dismiss you. Uh, Instead, just use this time to meet with Jesus. If you need to stay in your seat for a while, you need to do business. God has exposed some, some accommodated sin, some tolerated idols in your heart, and you just need to ask Jesus to root that out. Man, we're going to have two songs. Just spend some time. Meet with Jesus, and whenever you're ready, you get up and you come forward. Uh, Additionally, I'm going to go in the back. We're going to have some other pastors and volunteers in the back. And um, if God's stirring something in your heart and you need someone to pray with you, uh, just go ahead and make your way back to where the donut bar is. We're going to be standing out in front of there, in there, and we would love to pray with you and pray for you. So let's pray together. Jesus, this morning we celebrate the picture of the gospel that we see in Judges chapter 1. Judges chapter 1, I just feel like we see a mirror of our own hearts. We did not drive out this sin. We accommodated this. We left this idol lay. God, we are such a half-hearted people, but, but so too we get a picture of our fully devoted Savior who, who pursued us even when we were so tolerant of our sin. And you made that promise that you would never leave or forsake us, and you fulfilled that promise on the cross. And God, I pray that that would encourage, convict, challenge, and equip hearts this morning. Um, that we would turn from our sins, turn from our idols, celebrate the good work of Jesus Christ, and that you would rule and reign in our hearts and lives. God, would you meet with us now as we sing, as we partake of communion. In Jesus' name we pray.